Thanks, Omar. So, yeah, so this is going to be about some, um, an exchange format we've developed called, uh, called PXF and the kind of like uh, the kind of eco tool ecosystem around that. Um, so, um, just to kind of like frame, uh, frame the discussion, um, you know, many of us obviously are very familiar with working with, with sequence data and one, uh, one thing that helps us a lot with that is the fact that we've got very nice standards that have been around, some of them being around for, um, you know, a couple of decades for representing both uh, sequence data and features on sequences. And this is very nice because it allows us to build up an ecosystem of libraries and tools and APIs that allows us to, to um, take this data and do operations on it. For example, given two sequences, compute whether or not they are, they are similar in some, and un, related in some, some meaningful way. Now, what happens if we want to do the, the same kinds of uh, computations on phenotypes? So let's say we have um, a, a human phenotype such as obesity, and we want to say, well, what are some of the, uh, the, the model organisms? Uh, what, what genes are mutated in model organisms that give rise to, to the same kind of phenotype? And we end up getting in a big kind of uh, tangle, much as we, we did in the early days of genomics before we had these nice uh, exchange formats for, for representing um, our data. So what are the reasons for this? Why are we kind of like so behind in coming up with uh, exchange formats for phenotypic data compared to genomics? Well, I mean, one reason is, you know, perhaps there's just uh, an increase of interest in this area right now as kind of genomes move into the clinic and we're kind of become very interested in, in human phenotypes as well. Those of us coming from a model organism perspective, you know, maybe have been interested in this for a while. But um, I think, you know, one of the main reasons is, is phenotypes are, are kind of like hard, they're, they're difficult. And to, to illustrate this, I want to take you through the phenotyping of um, a, a nice strain of uh, uh, laboratory mouse, muscul musculus, characterized by Disney et al. in 1928. So this is a slightly uh, freakish example <laughs> of, of a mouse. So um, some of the phenotypes we might see here are giant big white paws, <laughs> morphological phenotypes. And then these are, are the strange kind of big round ears. Now, you know, we can do morphology in a very precise way. You know, there's a kind of the field of morphometrics has been around for a while, but it, to be honest, it's like really hard and maybe not worth the effort in all cases. So most of the time when dealing with morphological phenotypes, we just have kind of like squishy, somewhat subjective natural language descriptions. And, and then going beyond morphology, we have kind of behavior and mental states, which are kind of quite hard to model as well. So Mickey here has a conspicuously happy uh, disposition, um, as many of you may have encountered so far here. Um, we also have kind of like strange patterning, like the strange coat coloring in the, the pelvic area. And another issue is sometimes it's actually quite hard to see what's going on. You know, sometimes our assays don't reveal the underlying phenotypes. Like what exactly is going on inside these shoes? I mean, does anyone know? <laughs> Could be some kind of giant bird-like claws or <laughs> some, who knows. <laughs> and, and some phenotypes um, you can describe by looking at them from different levels of granularity. And this can contrast with genomic data where we're pretty much always looking at one kind of molecular level. So something like uh, the absence of whiskers on, on Mickey uh, can be viewed at a kind of like a gross kind of observational level, but we can kind of dive down into the histological level and look at the actual kind of like uh, the cells and what's happening there and say, oh yeah, well maybe it's actually due to a mutation in the, the SPINC5 gene that uh, we have these mutations in the, and these changes in the stratum corne corneum layer that give rise to the absence of hair in, in that region. So um, one way we can we can help to kind of like get a handle on this kind of squishiness and complexity is to use, to use ontologies. And as many of you I'm sure are, are familiar with, there's uh, a number of ontologies analogous to the gene ontology for describing wild type function that can be used to describe um, abnormal phenotypes in humans, mice, and other animals. So we have the term uh, absent vibrissae from MP, the mammalian phenotype ontology, and the human phenotype ontology actually has a term for a conspicuously happy disposition, 
<laughs> but it's not always quite as simple as that. Sometimes we, want to, we might want to use multiple ontology terms to describe the same phenotypic feature. So our ontology may not have terms for uh, round ears, for example, so we may want to compose these on the fly using multiple different phenotype terms. In some cases, we, uh, we, we may actually want to describe temporal aspects of the phenotype as well, such as acanthosis is happening at this particular stage of, uh, of mouse, mouse development. And, and then in some cases, not all of our phenotypes are qualitative, such as round ears. We may actually want to measure Mickey's tail here, where we may want to use, uh, add to our ontology terms some kind of like, uh, some kind of values as well, such as a length in, in meters. And so this is really just, um, you know, just the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of some of the, the subtleties we have. So we took all this into consideration when coming up with our design for a, a phenotype exchange format. And these are just some of the, the kind of like the criteria and requirements we, we looked at. Um, so rather than focus specifically on the exchange format per se, we take a very kind of model driven approach. And from, from this data model, we can derive different syntactic rec representations, YAML, JSON, uh, RDF, and tab separated values as well. And even though our main focus was uh, for, for the clinic, we wanted this to work uh, not just for, for kind of like mammals and vertebrates, but for, for any organism or any collection of organisms through microbes through to, through to plants as well. And not just to describe the organisms themselves, but to be able to associate phenotypes with other kinds of entities, such as genes, genotypes, alleles, and so on. Um, we really wanted to make it simple to use for the simple cases, but at the same time, allow it to be extensible to capture some of the details that are really important for, our, for certain groups of, of people and users. And some of these more complex aspects include uh, the temporal and causal aspects of phenotypes. You know, we may want to model that what, what, having one phenotype typically leads to having another phenotype. We want to be able to model both qualitative and quantitative measurements as well. Uh, and in addition, we want to be able to say not only that phenotype is present, but that the phenotype is absent, or that it's present in a certain percentage of the population, or that it's present in a very severe form or a, a moderate form. Um, and we wanted to use ontologies in, in a kind of like um, a fairly smart way and make the semantics absolutely explicit. So, but what, how most people will interact with it is with the actual kind of exchange format itself. Um, so we actually allow you to use either YAML or JSON as the primary kind of canonical exchange formats. YAML is the advantage, it's kind of quite nice to look at and nice to kind of like author in a, in a text editor if, if you like doing that sort of thing. But JSON is more, more or less the kind of a, the lingua franca of the, of the web. So, so there's some kind of mild annoyances in interconverting between those two, but essentially that, that works. And there are tab separated formats as well that um, are only there for like very simple use cases because they have they have lower expressivity. So to, just to give kind of give you um, a brief flavor, um, the idea here is you can we have a phenopacket, packet, um, just a single file or document on the left. It's kind of essentially broken into chunks. You've got a header chunk, you've got a bunch of entities, and you've got a bunch of associations. So the entities in this kind of like clinical case could be a list of, of patients, you know, Mickey Mouse, Goofy, and so on. Um, you can include basic kind of like metadata on the entities here, um, but the meat of it is in this association section here. And we have essentially a phenotype profile that are essentially associations between the entities and uh, phenotype objects. And we chose to go for a kind of like um, a key value type reference here, and this gives certain advantages such that you can break the file up and kind of like send it over the wire separately rather than having everything be embedded objects. And in the simplest case, all you're going to have here is, is your phenotype. But because we're using YAML or JSON, we can kind of nest things arbitrarily. So we use a kind of very kind of compositional pattern where inside the phenotype object, you can enhance it with other kinds of features such as temporal features to say what the time of onset was for, for the phenotype. Um, whereabouts it was located specifically, and as well as to give you the option of using free text as well if you, if you, if you want to do that. And so this is a similar example, just showing uh, to variant phenotype associations as well. 
Um, and this part is, is kind of like uh, less, less stable at the moment. We're still, the variant part of the schema is still um, under some, some discussion. So um, the JSON we use is actually valid uh, JSON-LD. Um, so what this means is that um, you essentially have a direct mapping to, to, to RDF um, for, for your JSON documents. And even if you don't care so much about the RDF, another nice feature is that it gives you an un unambiguous way to in interpret the identifiers in the model. So this is a kind of like a visual example of a pheno packet um, in the JSON LD RDF form, where you've got the ontology classes in the top layer and the individuals and the connections between them in the in the lower layer. So we have kind of like uh, you know, Mickey has this phenotype, which is an instance of stratum corneum detachment in the facial region that st starts during Tyler stage 27. So the core model um, is defined in a Java reference implementation. It uses kind of immutable plain, uh, plain Java objects with Jackson annotations that allows us to derive um, the canonical JSON schema. And we're also um, experimenting with uh, protocol buffers as well. This is partly for kind of interoperation with other groups such as the Global Alliance for Genomes and Health Initiative. Um, and this, uh, this, this provides you with a kind of like a reference API in Java or for any JVM language. For non-JVM languages, we have um, a kind of an early version of, of a Python, Python bindings and a kind of very early kind of like alpha level kind of uh, JavaScript bindings. We want help if anyone wants to do bindings for, for Perl or for, for Golang or any of these other things, uh, we'd be interested in hearing from you. Um, and of course, you can just use directly JSON or YAML or RDF level libraries. You can kind of like, as you might expect, you can store, store the JSON directly in, uh, in something like kind of Elasticsearch. So, you know, we could, we could explore using this within, uh, within BioThings, for example. We don't yet have uh, shadow bindings. Uh, some of the tools that we have, um, we've got command line tools called PXF tools. We have a Google Summer of Code student working on something called Pheno Packet Scraper, which pulls uh, phenotypes automatically from case study articles. We've got the, the analog of Blast or Blat in a tool called LSIM that allows you to search a database of phenopackets um, based on phenotypic similarity. And Seth already mentioned the web phenote extension to Noctua that allows you to, to author phenopackets. Uh, within uh, the Monarch Initiative project, we've implemented uh, ways of exporting uh, pheno packets from some of our, our data at the moment. So you should see this uh, on more of our pages now, where you can just click on export and, for example, on a variant page and get back a list of, of all the variant phenotype annotations. So um, one of the major challenges moving forward is modeling not only phenotype, but how the environment modulates um, the phenotype as well. So this includes things like diet exposures, how increased calorie intake could lead to phenotypes such as abnormal glucose metabolism, and indeed representing molecular phenotypes as well is something that we're, we're interested in moving forward. Um, but um, at the moment, the, the standard is still kind of like in, in a beta, so we're looking for community recommendations as to um, how well it works for your case, and we're also very interested in hearing if you want to hearing from you if you want to kind of like uh, develop language or database bindings or, or applications uh, for, for Fina packets. So I just want to thank some of the other people involved. Um, people marked with stars are here at uh, ISMB or one of the SIGs, so you should come and come and look for us and, and ask us any questions if you, if you have them. Mm -hmm.